I just want to welcome everybody to at Capsum, which is How Sound. How Sound is the epicenter of who we are and where we come from as Squamish people. How Sound is roughly a triangular sound that joins a network of fjords. Its mouth is situated between West Vancouver and the Sunshine Coast, and then opens 42 kilometers northeast to its head in Squamish. Archaeologists believe the first inhabitants occupied this area over 9,000 years ago. Their culture evolved into what we know today as the Coast Salish and Squamish nations. They lived off the rich resources that Howe Sound has to offer, everything from salmon to shellfish to the cedar trees on the water's edge. To this day, the Squamish people still gather in Howe Sound, but the importance of the area goes far beyond food. It provides critical ecosystem services valued at $7.5 billion annually, including clean water, protection from natural disasters, and a place to recreate. In fact, every year, more than 2 million people travel to Eastern Shore en route to Squamish, Whistler, and Pemberton. It's also home for an abundance of marine life, everything from some of the world's only glass sponge reefs to endangered killer whales. But this hasn't always been the case. It wasn't too long ago that parts of the Sound were considered some of the most polluted areas in North America because of mining and other heavy industry. And it took a collaborative effort between First Nations, local municipalities, and the provincial government to bring the ecosystem back to life. But now, it seems history is repeating itself, as climate change is stressing out an already vulnerable habitat. And how Sound is on the brink of disaster once again. Toward the end of the 1800s, in the post industrial revolution period, signs of copper were discovered here at Mount Shear. And this allowed a company to move in and start developing what would eventually become the single largest copper producer in the British Empire. Over 60,000 people from 50 different countries flocked to Britannia Beach to work in the booming mine. The community was thriving. It had schools, a church, even a bowling alley. For a long period in its history, it was considered to be one of the most desirable workplaces in the area, and I think played a really key role in establishing many of the communities that we know and love today. While Britannia Beach was thriving, just across the railroad tracks was How Sound, and underneath the surface, signs of trouble were starting to show. This mine was valuable to people because of the presence of heavy metals, particularly copper, but also zinc for part of its history. And one thing that's always been true is that when water comes into contact with those minerals, it picks up traces of them and then carries those traces into the waters of Howe Sound. When rain and snow fall into open pits and is exposed to sulfide mineralization, it forms acid mine drainage. The acid water polluted local waterways, soil, sediment, groundwater, and eventually Howe Sound. When the mine was operational, 40 million liters of mineral-laden waters were discharged into the Sound daily, making it one of the largest metal pollution sources in North America. These pollutants were toxic to fish and are believed to have killed millions of salmon each year. It's hard for a lot of smaller organisms to survive in areas that are highly contaminated with heavy metals, and that has a cascading effect up the food chain. If things like mussels and barnacles are less able to establish, there's less reason for mobile organisms to come to those areas. We know from studies that some fish, including salmon, can have their senses impacted if they're exposed to higher levels of copper, which probably reduces their ability to hunt and reduces their reproductive success. I remember growing up as a young Squamish person learning that that area around Britannia and, and largely the sound was dead. In 1974, after 70 years of operating, the Britannia mine shut down. But the impacts would be felt for much longer. Smaller organisms were killed from the toxins, while larger marine life like whales wouldn't be seen in this area for decades. We as indigenous peoples of this land and belonging to this place have a, have a responsibility um, to ensure that we're passing on something better to the next generation. And so with that in mind, we really start working on the revitalization and knowing that we couldn't do it ourselves, that we needed to work together with others, and that we needed to put government and everybody on notice that that was a strong desire of the Squamish people is to revitalize the sound. 
The Squamish Nation and other community groups started lobbying to the government for action. And in 2005, the BC government signed a $27 million contract with EPCOR. The following year, they opened their facility and treated 4 billion litres of water, removing more than 255,000 kilograms of heavy metals. This helped reduce the pollution going into the area by 90%. And slowly, life started to return to the sound. It's probably been the last 20 years or so since all of this remediation work was put in place um, that some of the healthy rebound in the sound has been seen, such as bigger cetaceans, whales and dolphins coming back, which hadn't been seen for a long time. In the last 10 years, for the first time in recorded history, Pacific salmon started returning upstream here at Mount Shear. I always believe that Britannia and the work we did around there with others was really a catalyst to kind of start doing other things. Because it was really one of the first times that we start working together as a community in the Sound. Shortly after the mine shut down, they reopened their doors, but this time as a museum, educating visitors on the past, present and future of mining in Canada. That means not shying away from conversations about remediation from talking to people about how the water treatment plant has dramatically reduced the impact of heavy metal exposure in our waters, to discussing how the mining industry is finding new frontiers for ways to identify their impact. But unfortunately, this story doesn't actually have a happy ending, just yet. As indigenous peoples of this land, we have seen it and felt it firsthand in terms of the access to the resources, the health of our land and our waters. It's an infringement on our culture and who we are as, as people. If the salmon don't return, the transmission of that knowledge of how to harvest salmon and what to do and the, the different teachings um, get lost. We used to harvest different types of whales in the Sound because it used to be a calving ground for the whales. We used to harvest sea lions and seals. Um, we don't do that anymore because it was lost because of the impacts. In 2017, the Coastal Ocean Research Institute and the Vancouver Aquarium Marine Science Centre worked together to create the Ocean Watch Report. Near the back of the report was a section on oceanography and climate change. In 2020, they did a follow-up report, but this time, climate change was the main focus. It's impacting everything and everyone. It doesn't matter where you are and whether you think you're affected or not, it is impacting everywhere. And so we really wanted to elevate that. The report highlighted seven different climate themes, from shoreline erosion to ocean acidification. And six out of the seven categories had a rating of critical. We are already seeing warmer air temperatures in winter and in summer, a lot more marine heat waves, and things such as stream flows start to change. The timing of those spring melts which triggers plankton blooms in the marine environment, which are the base of the food web in How Sound. So when you see something from the very bottom starting to change, it's a bit of a house of cards. If one thing changes, everything above it starts to be impacted as well. According to the report, the impacts of climate change reach much further than underwater habitats. Storms that are coming through are a lot more intense and they're becoming a lot more frequent. And so there tends to be more shoreline erosion. We've got maybe 10 years to really turn things around before we have absolute irreparable damage done. If we don't start correcting how we are operating today in terms of ensuring that we're doing everything we can around climate change, history will repeat itself. You probably heard that uh, we're working together with a group of people to create a UNESCO biosphere for how sound. I love the idea of a biosphere reserve because it, it really makes you realize that you have to have some core protected areas. For the past four years, Vancouver City Councilor and Chair of Metro Vancouver Climate Action Committee Adrian Carr has been advocating to make Howe Sound a UNESCO biosphere. In 2019, the project was unanimously approved and forwarded to Ottawa. It's now waiting final approval in Paris. We have already uh, pushed ourselves up very close to the brink and um, so uh, action, ha we can't delay. This map shows the proposed area for the Biosphere Reserve, 218,723 hectares consisting of a core area where if approved, there'll be no industrial development. There's a recognition that that core area will have its natural uh, systems kept intact and enhanced if necessary. Outside of the core, there are buffer zones and transition areas. 84% of the proposed biosphere is terrestrial and 16% marine, protecting valuable ecosystems like glass sponge reefs and rockfish conservation. A UNESCO biosphere would be part of the solution, but creating a protected area is just a piece of the puzzle in the fight against climate change. 
The recent Ocean Report included a section dedicated to Action Plan, highlighting areas like research, protecting and restoring marine habitats, educating and engaging the public, and creating new legislation. They've also created the Ocean Watch Action Committee, whose members are working with local municipalities to come up with ways to reduce carbon emissions. Every day we have a choice. We can be either part of the solution or continue to be part of the problem. If we move from our normal combustion engine to a hybrid vehicle or to an electric vehicle, we're already contributing there. If we reduce our air travel, we are contributing there. Together we can do a lot more than individually. There's been a lot of community initiative and drive to see what they love protected. Just like when we did that great work at Britannia Mine and the whales came back, they were telling us, continue to do this good work. We've got to continue to do the hard work and listen to the experts that are saying, we need to reduce carbon. We need to all take a responsibility to tackle climate change because it's the big issue that's impacting all of us. It's not just the Squamish people, it's everybody.